Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Four? Hey, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This morning, we're going to look at the sign, the fifth sign, of Jesus walking on the water. This is a quick recap. Well, this is the total of the seven signs. So, we've already looked at Jesus turning water into wine. Jesus heals the official's son. Jesus heals the paralytic man. Jesus fed the 5,000. We looked at that last week. Today, we're looking at Jesus walking on the water. We're going to look at Jesus heals a man born blind and Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. That's the seven signs that John chose to specifically reference in his gospel um, in the New Testament. John tells us the reason that he picked these seven things for us. So in John 20, verses 30 to 31, we read this. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. We believe Jesus was and is the Son of God, that he was fully man and fully God, and that he has power to do amazing things. He has power over sickness, as we've just heard testimony, 325 healings at New Day. Jesus healed when he was on this earth, recorded in the New Testament, Jesus is still healing today. Jesus has power over the natural elements of this world. He multiplied food and fed 5,000, as we heard last week. We're gonna hear how he walks on water today. By believing in Jesus, we can have life. John uses that word life and he expands it in his gospel. So what is having life? Two references in John's gospel. John 10.10, 10, the thief, that's the enemy of Jesus and God and his kingdom. The thief comes to kill, steal and destroy. I'll come back to that later. But I have come, that's Jesus, that they may have life and have it to the full. So what is the life that Jesus offers us? It's life to the full. Some other translations call it abundant life. And also, John 3.16, a very famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Life now with Jesus is full and abundant, but it is more than this earthly life. There's an eternal life that Jesus offers. These signs are to demonstrate and show that we might choose to believe in the one who gives life. Now, let's look at our passage. I showed you that clip of the canoeing. We were a group of friends going to go out and cross some water. We're going to look at an account now in John about another group of friends, the disciples, who crossed a body of water in a boat. Suffice it to say that at least four of them were professional fishermen. So they knew what they were doing. They were used to handling um, the boat and they were going. Let's read together. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they'd rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water and they were frightened. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. We've only got five verses um, to look at. And in one sense, of the seven signs, this is different to the other six. All the other six have a sort of public element. They were done in front of varying amounts of people. But it's like we're zooming in this morning. And this is a moment with Jesus and his disciples. And so I think there's probably a reason for that. And we get this account in chapter 6. And it's sort of sandwiched if you've read chapter 6. Jesus feeds the 5,000. Then we get these five verses about Jesus walking on the water. And then we have this big explanation about what the feeding of the 5,000 was all about. What's called the discourse of the bread of life. But this little cameo is sandwiched in the middle. I wonder why. The main thing 
I would like you to remember or take away is this. My question to me and to you this morning is, how do we cope in the storms of life? Is our response fear or is it faith? Last time I preached, and it's all recorded on YouTube, so there's no escaping it. I preached for 43 minutes, and our target is 30. So I'm trying to simplify. I love the opportunity to preach and teach God's word, but I feel like I have to cover it all. And so I'm going to try and be disciplined. Hence this. Look, you see, tick. See, that's not helping me at all, is it? See, screen, it's only on for 30 seconds, so that's not... Can we... We've got old school. We're all right. We're on old school. You're getting to know me, aren't you? So, I think there's a reason, and we need to just look a little beyond our passage. This account of Jesus walking on the water is covered in two of the other Gospels. The Gospels are four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's what we call the Gospels. And this account is covered in Matthew and in Mark. And both of those accounts start like this. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. So he got them to do something, and he was going to do something. Dismiss the crowd, the crowd that he'd just fed. Again, in Mark's account, again, the same point, immediately. Now that to me says there's a sense of urgency. Why was Jesus so keen to get his disciples away, and he needed to do something with the crowd? Let's just look at the bookends to this uh, passage. So, Jesus has performed the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. You see, they could not deny that this was a powerful man. And their assumption and their conclusion was, this is a guy worth following. Let's make him king. They wanted to make him king really for their own agenda so that they might be able to come out from under the oppression of the Romans. Their assessment of his power was totally correct. Their application of that power was totally incorrect. And their motivation was also incorrect. But Jesus, you see, he perceived this and it would have been a great moment. He's just fed 5,000. They're claiming him a king. Jesus could have said, let's ride this wave. Come on, guys. We are flavor of the month. I want to be king. See, Jesus submitted himself to his father's plan. And he chose to follow that plan and that timing and to lay aside the accolade of men. And there's a danger for us. In church leadership or leadership of any time, when things are going well and people say nice things about you and to you, it's really easy to, oh, I've done great, haven't I? <laughs> I'm really rocking this. Jesus chose not to be made king in that moment. He was king, he was going to be king, he always is king, always will be king. But there was a plan and there was a purpose. Let's beware the wrong motivation and application of what Jesus is doing. At the end of our passage, Jesus said, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, but not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. You see, the crowd saw Jesus as a meal ticket and he was serving their agenda to feed them and provide for them. And they wanted to make him king. Jesus won't do that. Jesus is our saviour. He has many, many things. But he will not be used just to serve us. And I think there's a warning there. We need to just be careful. So, they've crossed the lake, as we've read. They've got into trouble, and Jesus walks on the water towards them. Now, they've got form in this department. This happened before. There was a storm on the lake, and they got Jesus actually with them in the boat. So this wasn't a first time occurrence. This had actually happened to them before. We read in Matthew. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came upon the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. 
The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up, rebuked the wind and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. In this instance, we see what is called the humanity of Jesus and the divinity of of Jesus. When I was at school, that was a long time ago, we studied divinity. I just as I was preparing this, I thought divinity, that's not a word we use very often these days, is it? But I think before, it's religious studies, I think, these days, isn't it, in school? Yeah? But I can remember writing on my exercise book. Remember those blue exercise books? If you, did you have those? If you're my age? Like, you know, your form and then subject, divinity. It just brought a school memory back for me. The humanity of Jesus, he was human in every way. In the book of Hebrews, which is at the end of the Old Testament, in Hebrews 2.17, it said Jesus was made like his brothers in every way. Jesus was absolutely exhausted and tired. Tired out. He was human. He knew what it was to be tired and exhausted. That's why he was asleep in the boat. But he was also divine and had power so that he could get up and speak to the wind and the waves and calm them. He is fully man, he is fully God. No wonder the disciples were confused and said, what kind of man is this? You might be investigating the claims of Jesus, the person of Jesus, and you might be asking that question, what kind of man is this? He was a man in the the way that he identifies with us, but he is also God and powerful and amazing. When storms come to us in life, do we respond with fear or with faith? You are serving me so well, and by serving me, serving them. This is the main thing I feel I want to challenge us on. I believe fear is the enemy of faith. Storms can just suddenly appear in our life. I've asked permission to share this first story. I've, de- I've declared I'm a doting granddad. A few weeks ago, Abby, Josiah's mom, um, got COVID. She's dodged it all this time, and uh, she got COVID. And Josiah developed a rash. And when you get a rash, you do the glass test, and it didn't disappear. And so it was query meningitis. So Josiah ended up in Frimley Park, query meningitis. I'd been out at work, I came home, and I'm given the news. Storms can just come like that. And that was a personal storm for me and for our family. I just had to stand back and think, that's, if it is that, meningitis, that's not good. We have two options at that moment. Are we going to give in to fear, or are we going to stand on faith? and the word and the promise and the goodness of God. I want to honor Colin and Colleen. It's Colleen, Colin's not here. Is she here? Great, Colleen. Their first response to storms like that is always prayer. We have lived in Camberley now for 14 years. Colleen was one of the first women that Sally got to know in the church. Little did we know then, they'd become our in-laws, and we love them to bits. It's great to be able to do life and church and fellowship together with them. But they were told over their phone, and before that was, phone was hung up, they prayed for Josiah. Now, it ran through. It wasn't meningitis, praise God. He'd got, a, he'd got COVID as well, um, and it was a viral rash to do with COVID. But it was a storm that suddenly came upon us. Also, around that very same time, a friend called me one evening and said his wife had discovered a lump in her breast. And could I just pray for him? Because he'd gone straight to, what if? I remember the first time Sal said that to me. Um, without being too public, and <laughs> Sal's had cysts, and so she's had to deal with them a few times. And often, 
Storms sometimes happen in the middle of the night. And isn't it always worse in the middle of the night? True, I've got something to tell you. I found a lump in my breast. They were cysts for Sal, so I'm not going to claim drama. But for this friend of mine, wife went in, had a scan. It didn't look great, and so they did some more tests. But again, that's all come out. It's okay. It's not cancer. But, stop, but that was just an ordinary day. I just worked an ordinary day. I'd come home, and I got a call from a friend and said, please, can you just help me? Storms can just come like that. Some storms... Like those two, they were a few days, perhaps seven days for our friends to get resolved. Other storms last for quite a while, or their consequences last for a while. And I don't want to minimize, I believe there are people going through storms that are sat in this room today. And I believe God in his love and his grace wants to speak to you in tenderness and gentleness. I am not here to upbraid you for your lack of faith and your giving into fear. I am here to warn you about the danger of giving into fear and the challenge of lifting our eyes off circumstance to Jesus that he might come and bring breakthrough and comfort. So please, I believe God has called me to be a pastor and a teacher. I want to teach the word of God with a pastor's heart. And so if you're going through a horrendous storm right now, I do not minimize that in any way. Please hear my heart. You see, fear is the enemy of faith. Jesus said back in John 10.10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's the enemy's agenda. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy you. Jesus has come to give you life, and life in all its fullness. The pathway to life in all its fullness, and eternal life, as John 3.16 says, the pathway to that is fear. The pathway to killing, stealing, and destroying is fear. Two different tactics, two different strategies from two different camps. You see, fear challenges faith. Is that really true? Can God be trusted? Has he got the power to sort this out? It questions faith. It blinds faith. In the account that we've read, it says the disciples were terrified. In the other accounts, it says they they didn't know who it was. They thought it might have been a ghost. So even God's provision coming to them to deal with their situation, they didn't recognize because fear had gripped them and so blinded them that they couldn't even see the provision. And I believe there may be people who are blinded right now because of the turmoil of the storm in which you're walking through. I didn't say at the beginning, I'm one of the Elders of the church, that's one of the leadership team. Um, I'm not on staff, I work an ordinary job. But because of that, I know who's amongst us. And there's lots of people who I don't know. And so I'm aware of storms that are taking place. So this is just not supernatural revelation to me. I'm aware of some personal circumstances that are storms. But I also trust God enough to know that there's a lot of faces in here that I don't recognize (laughs) And God may want to speak to you specifically and individually this morning from this passage. Beware of fear blinding faith. It seeks to destroy our faith. That's the enemy's tactic. Storms often come. We can have health storms. We can have financial storms. We can have employment storms. We can have relational storms. There are four major categories into which life can be thrown upside down. I referred to earlier, I've been painting and decorating for 40 years. I was at school, I was bottom of the top set. I don't claim to be an academic. My dad was a painter and decorator, and my uncle was a joiner. And I wanted to work outside in weather like this. 
And I found I could work outside in weather like this as a painter. And do you know what the bonus is? People paid me to do it as well. <laughs> and when I was 16 and 17 and 18, the suntan was enough. I'm sorry, that's, I know that's vain. I know that's vain. I'm sorry, you'll just have to take me as I am. And the fact that I got paid at the end of the week literally was a bonus to me at that age. Now, when I got married and had a mortgage and some kids, obviously the finance took on more of a significance. But I left school against advice. I didn't want to go to uni. I wanted to work outside. I wanted to work with my hands. I wanted to learn a trade. Was I going to be a joiner with my uncle or was I going to be a painter and decorator? My dad at this time had run his business for a while and he had gone into full-time ministry. But as a painter and decorator, you don't need much to start. A few brushes, a roller in a bucket, a ladder and a pair of steps, and off we go. And so, um, actually, I've skipped something. I left school and I went to work for the firm that my dad used to work for. Two elderly brothers, Harry and Soss. They're good Yorkshire names, aren't they? Soss was short for Cecil. Harry and Soss, they were in their early 60s. They took me on out of friendship and relationship still with my dad and said, yeah, we'll have Andrew as an apprentice. I did a year with them, went to college, started learning to be a painter and decorator. And after a year, Harry came to see my dad. And he said, Ray, I'm really sorry, but we're going to have to let Andrew go. We're looking to retire and we're winding down and we can't continue to provide his apprenticeship. That day, on that day, was a storm for me. I remember it as the worst day of my life in my few 16 years. I'd left school against advice, I'd started an apprenticeship, and I was now redundant, aged 17. That's when Dad said, let's go self-employed some. Now the church is a great circle to start self-employment in, because people are very friendly and empathetic. And our story as a family, my testimony, and forgive me, some of will have heard this many times, but it gives glory to God. I started with two weeks work. And my testimony is for 40 years, I've not had a week without work. And that's not because then I was a good decorator. I beg to differ now. I think, I think I'm all right. I think I'm all right. But then I wasn't. I really wasn't. And so it was goodwill that people gave me work. But God came to me in my storm of redundancy and provided a way out. And I could spend the next three hours telling you stories of how that was the right thing. I look back on that day that at the time in the moment was the worst day of my life. And I now call it the best day of my life. I am so grateful that I was made redundant. Please. If you've just made, been made redundant, you, mean, you may need some processing time. Okay, I am not wanting to be flippant about redundancy or employment or being out of work. But I am wanting to share my testimony that with the passage of time, what in the moment was horrendous was the provision of God for me, even though I didn't know it at the time. Because he had a plan for my life that I was not aware of, and that was to do me good and to prosper me. And actually, that's what he's done. Because God can be trusted. How to grow in faith. The challenge is fear or faith. I've put them this way around for a purpose. Get to know the God of the word. All right? And also, importantly, get to know the Word of God. That's the Bible. Okay? But I've put them that way around because a relationship with Jesus is that. It's personal and it's a relationship. It's not a thesis and an academic study. I've, in latter years, loved to study. But Jesus brings a serious warning to the Pharisees. I can't remember in which gospel it is now, but he says... You think by diligently searching the scriptures, you will find me. And he stood right in front of them, and they can't see him. The danger of academic study just for itself. Don't go out of this meeting and say, oh, Drew says we don't need to read the Bible. It's just a personal relationship with Jesus. Just have it this way around, please. Seek the personal relationship with Jesus and read your Bible as well. Because a personal relationship with Jesus, you get to know him. 
and what he's like, and you can trust him. Not just the promises he says in his word. <sighs> okay, we're counting down. Another example. We offered our house to a family in the church whose son was getting married. And his fiance was from America, and the family were coming in from America. And so we gave them our house um, as a base on the Friday to get ready from and go to the wedding. But we were just in renovation, and we were just redone our ensuite and our bedroom and knocked walls down, and we love doing things like that. It's great. But let's just say, the wedding was Saturday. The son's parents, I'm gonna keep this anonymous, came to see progress on the Tuesday. Let's just say it looked like a bomb site. It looked like a building site, and if you didn't have the eye of faith, you were like, is this gonna be ready for this family to move in on Friday? Well, I've said it will be ready, but if you don't know me or trust me, all the evidence says it's not going to be ready. It was ready. I thrive on deadlines, <laughs> adrenaline, and pressure to get things done. I knew I could deliver it, and I think they did, but they were like, oh, I'm really not sure. We're inviting these people into our family, and they've got to sleep in this room and it looks nowhere near ready. I pulled it off and it was fine because they trusted me. They knew the character of me, not just my word. And that's what you need to do with Jesus. You need to spend some time, get to know him. Can God be trusted? Yeah, he can. He really can. Now the caveat is, his timing's not always our timing, is it? If there's some long-standing Christians here, you'll have walked through that lesson. We'll learn that when we come right to the end when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. He was late, wasn't he? So Mary and Martha thought, because Lazarus died. Jesus has let him die, but it was for a bigger purpose. Jesus is never late. He's always on time. But sometimes we have to learn to trust him and his timing. So get to know this wonderful man called Jesus. How do you do that? There's so many ways, but find what works for you. I, I, I've just done a couple of jobs for people who've gone on holiday, and that's great. I mean, I, I, if I'm working for you, that's fine if you want to be around. But when people have gone on holiday, I just have worship on for eight hours. I just do. And I just paint on my own. I don't speak to any, I'm an introvert. So I went fishing on Tuesday. Sat for 10 hours on a bank catching fish in the sun. It was marvelous. <laughs> there were only two other guys fishing and I only exchanged five words with one of them. <laughs> I like to be outside in nature and creation and see the wonder of God. That might be how you connect with God. There are multiple ways. Spend time getting to know him, being with him, understanding the personal nature of God. Opportunities in a storm. Storms aren't always negative. They may appear negative in the moment. You see in our story, the wind and the waves came, but Jesus draws close in the storm. And especially if you're in a storm, we're going to come on worship. Band, if you want to come back, please. We're going to come back to worship and then I'm going to come back up and I'm going to pray. And if you're in a storm this morning, I want to pray that Jesus will draw close to you. It's been my experience, I became a Christian when I was 15, that I've grown more through challenge than ease. It's just a reflection of life, really. So there's an opportunity to grow in the storm. The passage ends with, they were willing to take Jesus into their boat. And so I want to ask you, are you willing? Have you invited Jesus into your boat, to use that sort of term? Have you got a personal relationship with Jesus? There's an opportunity today to do that and find out more about him. Or is Jesus not in your boat right now? You're a Christian, a follower of Jesus, but life is just so overwhelming at the moment that he's not with you. Or it feels like he's not with you. You see, in the first story, Jesus was in the boat and asleep because he knew we were going to the other side. 
Jesus came to die, but not in the middle of the Lake of Galilee. He died on a cross. That was his time, that was his place, that was his mission, and nothing would frustrate it. You might feel like, literally, I'm gonna die. Jesus comes. Are you willing to re-invite Jesus into your boat? Perhaps because fear has blinded you or questioned your faith and your trust in the goodness of God. And again, I want to reiterate, the consequences of some storms, particularly bereavement, can last for a while. And there is grace. Praise God for his amazing grace. You know, it's like, the disciples have been through this once before. I'm a visual learner. My son is frustrated with me on my phone and my computer skills, which are just rubbish. He's like, why can't you get it? I have to repeat, learn, repeat, learn, repeat, learn. Fortunately, Jesus is like that with us. So when they, first time in the storm, oh, you have little faith. Second time, you could have thought Jesus' response was gonna be, right, you're in disciples' detention. We've been through this once. I told you, faith, not fear. And we get to the other side. You're all in detention. No, what did he say? It's me. Don't be afraid. I'm coming to you. It wasn't even the request of their prayer. God in his grace just came. That's who he is. You're like a circle that floats around me Keeping me safe and sound And when I fall, you've tied a rope to me You're blessing me every day